Um, hey everyone, welcome. Um, today we have another seminar of the data learning um, every Tuesday. Today we have Dr. Savannah Thais from Princeton University. She completed her PhD in Yale University and she's currently working with geometric deep learning. So Savannah, thank you for doing this and go ahead and I'll leave the audience with you. Uh, okay, great. Thank you so much um, for uh, for having me, let me uh, make this. Screen. Okay, hopefully that looks right. Um, yeah, so I'm Savannah Tate. I'm a research scientist at Princeton, um, working at the intersection of physics and uh, machine learning. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, particularly using graph neural networks um, for charged particle reconstruction at the Large Hadron Collider. Um, great. So um, a quick outline. Um, I'm going to talk about kind of what uh, uh, data looks like coming out of uh, high energy physics experiments. Then I'll talk about um, work on using uh, graph what, what graph neural networks are and how we can use them for a specific problem in, uh, in uh, high energy physics data reconstruction. Then I'll talk about um, some of the really interesting current work that my group has been doing um, on this topic. Then I'll introduce another new paper that we just put out on a slightly different reconstruction task, um, but still using GNNs. And then if there's time, um, I'll talk a bit about how we can accelerate uh, the inference of these GNN algorithms. Cool, so starting off with um, high energy physics data. So. Uh, in particle physics, we have uh, this model called the standard model um, that describes the particles that make up all visible matter um, in the universe, including, you know, uh, us, um, humans, all of the uh, matter on Earth, uh, in the universe, um, including light um, and other particles that we're maybe not as familiar with um, that are like passing through us right now that are produced from different reactions and interactions of particles. Um, the standard model also describes the particles that create um, almost all of the known forces in the universe, so things like electricity and magnetism, um, the strong force that holds um, quarks together inside of uh, protons and neutrons, um, the weak force that governs um, uh, uh, decay, uh, decays of uh, charged particles. Um, and so this is a really, really awesome model that has helped us understand a lot about the or origins of the universe, um, the way that different particles interact with each other to form matter um, and different types of materials. And um, the this, uh, this model and the interactions of all the different particles included in it are governed by um, this uh, set of mathematical rules described by the standard model Lagrangian, which you can see um, a reduced form of here. So this is a really, really powerful model, um, but it doesn't answer everything um, about particle physics. There are a lot of outstanding questions um, that we're still interested in in studying. So in particular, I said the standard model describes almost all forces in the universe. Um, so it actually does not describe gravity, which is uh, kind of the most intuitive force that we're all aware of um, and interact with um, on, you know, uh, constantly. Um, so there's actually no quantum model of gravity right now that has been verified experimentally. Um, so that's a big gap in the standard model. There's also lots of other questions, some of which I've highlighted here. Um, for instance, dark matter is a big open area of research. Um, we know that it, it should exist, um, but we don't know what a uh, um, what the particle uh, nature of dark matter could be. Um, and then there's lots of other kinds of, of theorized particles um, that could answer some questions that are left open by, um, by the standard model. So in order to try to answer some of these questions um, that I just highlighted and to look for new types of particles that people have theorized, um, we have this incredible machine, the Large Hadron Collider, um, which is a 17 mile proton-proton collider ring um, under the French Swiss border that collides um, billions of protons per second at almost the speed of light. Um, 
And because we have this mass energy equivalence described by e equals mc squared, these really high collisions or high energy collisions can create um, new types of particles, including really heavy particles, very rare particles that don't normally exist on Earth. Um, and then we can measure the decay products of these particles with specialized detectors and we can uh, capture really rich um, uh, multidimensional uh, complex uh, data sets about these particle decays and interactions. So here's one of my favorite um, just little visualizations of, of kind of what happens inside um, the LHC. So you see we have um, a pro protons coming in from both sides. Um, they collide with each other inside this um, really multifaceted, multi-layer detector, and they create sprays of new particles. And our goal is to um, on the software side of this work is to um, take the readouts of the detector, uh, information about how those new particles interacted with the material of the detector, um, and use uh, software and data processing and machine learning to figure out what actually happened right at that collision point. Um, so like I mentioned, the data from these collisions is measured uh, by uh, detectors with dedicated subsystems. Um, and so when uh, the particles are created and they move outwards from that interaction point, they interact with different types of material in the detector and they deposit uh, different amounts of energy in the different components. Um, then that energy is read out uh, with electronics and those readouts have to be reconstructed into um, particle components like trajectories um, and energy deposit groups. Um, and then those are further reconstructed into um, particle candidates. Um, so we can try to figure out um, there was a muon here, there was this kind of quark here. Um, they came from the same interaction or a different interaction. And we can start to reconstruct the full physics picture of what happened at that proton-proton uh, collision. Um, the, uh, there's a lot of uh, difficulties with this kind of reconstruction. In particular, we can only measure particles uh, that exist in the standard model um, and ones that um, interact with matter. So there's lots of particles that could be created that we can't necessarily measure. So it's really important that our reconstruction and data processing is very accurate um, because we have to do things like uh, see if there's missing energy from the event. If uh, not all of the energy from the original collision is accounted for, then we can extrapolate that there were other particles there that we're not able to measure um, and things like that. So it's very important to be hyper accurate in this type of reconstruction. Um, but there are several challenges with that, um, in particular for kind of traditional data formats that we use in machine learning. Um, so uh, one challenge is that um, the uh, data is not fixed size. We don't know how many particles are going to be created in any collision. We don't know what their decays are going to look like. So it's hard to be uh, it, it, in the past, we have tried to force this into kind of grid-like representations like we typically use in um, just standard neural networks or even images like we use in, in convolutional neural networks, but that always involves either some amount of padding or information loss. Um, another um, issue is that the data can be very dense and very high dimensional. Um, uh, so it can be difficult to uh, think about good data structures to represent that. Um, and then a really big constraint for building these uh, data processing algorithms is that we have extremely tight um, computing time and resource constraints. I mentioned we are colliding billions of protons a second. That creates way more data than we can actually store um, for further processing. So we have to have very, very efficient um, online data processing algorithms that work in uh, on the order of a few nanoseconds um, to decide if data is valuable to store or not. And this can be very high stakes. Some of the processes we're looking for, you know, happen once uh, in a trillion collisions. So we wanna be really careful um, that we're not throwing away important information. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna um, talk about a specific kind of task in that data reconstruction scheme that I mentioned um, called particle tracking. 
So um, like I mentioned, there's a large amount of dedicated software um, for forming physics objects from that raw detector data. And this is a really great place to use machine learning um, because traditional approaches before we really started incorporating machine learning in particle physics research um, was based a lot on kind of derived physics based variables that created um, information loss. Um, but machine learning, which is designed um, often to look uh, to work on high dimensional um, data sets, um, can uh, help us avoid some of that information loss. And we can actually go right from the detector readouts um, and use those directly in machine learning algorithms. Um, so there's kind of three main stages of data reconstruction. So there's object construction, where we take the raw detector data um, and we try to identify um, which components of it belong to individual particles. Um, then there's object matching and grouping where, um, so we try to um, match, we've identified objects in the different components of the detector that belong to a single particle. Then we try to join those together um, in, so that we have all the pieces of an individual particle grouped together. Um, we also try to group things, uh, decay products from a single particle that maybe decayed while it was in the detector, we try to group all of those components together as well. Um, and then there's object identification, or sometimes we call it tagging, where, okay, now we have all of the information, or we think we have all of the information from a certain particle um, in the detector. Um, so can we identify then what type of particle that was based on how it moved, what its charge was, um, maybe how it decayed. Um, so I'm going to focus on particle tracking, which is a, a task in that first set of object construction um, steps. So um, this deals with data from who we call the tracker, um, which is typically a very high granularity detector that's closest to that proton-proton collision. Um, so we get very high granularity um, information um, about how a particle moved um, uh, out from the collision point uh, towards uh, the outside of the detector. Um, and in particular, charged particles, which is primarily what we can measure at these detectors um, in a magnetic field. So the whole detector is, um, is uh, set inside a very, very strong magnetic field. Those charged particles move um, in helical trajectories because they're curved by uh, the magnetic field. Um, and so track reconstruction um, tries to take basically a point cloud of how all of the particles that were produced in a single collision have moved out through that high granularity tracker. It takes that point cloud and tries to identify individual particle trajectories from that point cloud um, and then estimate the different parameters of the trajectory. So um, we try to get the radius of the track um, which we can then use to get the velocity of the particle and therefore its momentum. Um, so this is a really important uh, step in, in uh, doing any kind of physics work with the data that we get out of these detectors. Um, like I said, it's one of the first steps that has to be done. So we really need it to be very um, accurate so that we're not introducing uncertainty that then gets propagated through the rest of the data processing steps. So it's a very important task, um, but it's also the most computationally intensive uh, research, uh, reconstruction task. Uh, that happens with this data. Um, and this is a big problem because there's a big planned upgrade for the Large Hadron Collider um, where we're going to be producing even more proton-proton collisions at the same time. So the scale of our data is going to really increase. Um, and unfortunately, with the current way that this uh, tracking uh, uh, is done. Um, it scales worse than quadratically with increasing number of particles that you're trying to reconstruct. Um, so as we move through this upgrade, it's just going to become um, untenable to use the current algorithms. They're going to, we're not going to have the computing resources to meet those needs. So we really need to innovate here and try to come up with um, new types of algorithms, new types of data representations, also ways to accelerate those algorithms, uh, maybe add parallelization, um, adapt to modern architectures like GPUs or FPGAs. Um, 
and different kinds of things like that. So that kind of motivates why we've started looking at um, graph neural networks um, for this problem. So graphs, um, as you might be aware, are a mathematical structure composed of nodes and edges, um, both of which can have associated information, which could be spatial information or any kind of other features. So graphs can really be used to represent um, many, many different types of relational or geometric data. Um, they're used a lot in the physical sciences beyond just particle physics, also for things like representing protein structures or things like that, but they can also be used for um, relational data like um, uh, different types of knowledge dependencies, social networks, all different kinds of, of relational structures. And they're a really intuitive representation um, for particle physics data in particular, because like I mentioned, we have variable size data. Um, so it's hard to, to work with traditional grid-based um, structures, even sequence-based structures, um, like for recurrent neural networks, there's no, um, physical ordering to the data. So uh, when that has been studied in the past, you have to enforce some kind of arbitrary um, sequence on the data. So graphs are actually um, a really intuitive, really appropriate representation scheme for this type of data. Um, because of the fixed size and ordering uh, or, or non-ordering, um, but also because we know there is a geometric component um, and structure to this data. We know that particles move outwards from, um, from the collision point. So there is an inherent geometric structure there. Um, and so I've shown some different examples here of ways that um, different types of particle physics data can easily be translated into graphs. So we have, for instance, um, uh, energy uh, deposit clusters in uh, what we call a calorimeter, a certain type of, of uh, detector component. Um, we can also represent once we have done some of the initial reconstruction stages, um, we can represent different particle types as nodes in a graph and start to learn, uh, use that to learn about the full physics uh, process that occurred in the collision. Um, we can also use it for like grouping different decay products together. Um, so really a lot of the different kinds of problems that we need to solve in particle physics, um, it makes sense to use these graph representations. So once you have a graph representation of your data, you need some kind of algorithm that can uh, uh, operate on that structure um, and really ex uh, exploit and make use of these nice features that I just described. Um, so the kind of most vanilla version of graph neural networks or message passing networks um, kind of work like this. They try to learn some kind of smart embedding of the graph structure um, where you can then do some downstream task like um, node classification, graph level classification, graph segmentation, um, different things like that. And they work by um, leveraging geometric information um, from the graph by passing and aggregating messages um, from a graph's neighborhood. So um, I know some of you might have seen it. I've seen, you know, GNNs be familiar with this, um, but I'll uh, just quickly explain them anyways. So in a, a node-based uh, message passing uh, GNN, what happens is you have um, some initial embedding for a particular node, um, which would typically be just the initial features of the graph node. Um, and then to uh, re-embed that node or update its features, um, you apply uh, a feedforward neural network um, to the aggregated information from all of the other nodes that that node is connected to. So you collect the previous embeddings um, of the node of all of its neighbor nodes, you do some kind of aggregation. Here it's averaging, but you can do different types of aggregation. Um, and then you can apply some transformation to that. Here we're also including um, a transformation of the node we're updating, its uh, previous embedding. Um, and then you apply some nonlinearity. Um, to that. And there's lots of modifications that people have looked at on this kind of basic structure. Um, you can use, you know, different 
kinds of information. You can uh, drop this previous node embedding um, or um, add other types of information, use different types of aggregations. Um, you can add um, you know, different uh, neighborhood combinations, things like that. There's lots of different modifications that can be made. Um, but this is kind of the core um, message passing structure um, that really makes the foundation of a lot of other GNN architectures. Um, and so what's really powerful about these is that by combining um, these embedding multiple of these uh, graph layers, we can start to collect information from farther and farther away on the graph. So that's kind of what's shown down here. Um, so if we're looking at updating this red node um, with the first uh, graph convolution layer, we get information from um, its immediate neighbors, these green nodes. Um, and then as we add another graph convolution layer, um, we get information from all the green nodes neighbors, which include these blue nodes, um, but also previous information about the node that we're actually trying to learn about. Um, and then so on for the third layer, you get information from the blue nodes layers, or sorry, blue nodes neighbors, um, which include the purple ones, but also again, then the previous embedding of the green, um, the green nodes, you can see how you start to progressively capture um, a lot of relational information from the graph. So how do we use this for that tracking problem I was talking about? So we've looked at a, a lot of different methods that I'll talk about in a few minutes, um, but the kind of most basic structure we've applied um, is that you form an initial graph, um, and I'll talk about different ways we can do that graph formation from um, a, a hit cloud uh, or from a point cloud of hits in the tracker. Then you process that graph through some kind of GNN um, to get probabilities on the edges. Um, so we want to try to figure out if the edges in the graph represent real uh, particle trajectory components or if they're just noise edges, false edges. Um, so we use the GNN to get um, edge weights or edge probabilities. And then we apply some kind of post-processing algorithm um, to link those classified edges um, together into a final track candidates. So you can kind of see how that looks like here um, in a, a very small scale example. So we have some initial graph. We want to learn uh, about these two, uh, we wanna learn that these two uh, green lines are the true particle trajectories. So our GNN would hopefully learn to downweight um, the red segments and up, upweight the green segments. And then um, these are already distinct clusters in this example, but in more complex data situations, um, you would have to do some kind of clustering as a final step um, to identify the final track candidates. So this is the very um, basic architecture that we've started with, but there's a lot of places to really um, build on this basic structure to innovate um, and I'll talk about some of the ways that we've been doing that. Um, and then just to note, um, the work shown here uses this um, track ML data set, which is an open source data set available to anyone. Um, so you could go run, uh, play around with it um, right now if you want to. Um, it's uh, based on uh, a detector from the Large Hadron Collider. So it has the same geometry, um, but it's open source data, which makes it really easy to collaborate with our um, with uh, different machine learning colleagues as well um, as kind of traditional physics researchers. Um, so the first step in that pipeline, like I mentioned, is graph construction. Um, and optimizing this step can really help whatever GNN architecture you use afterwards um, learn effectively. So we've looked at a few different um, methods right now for graph construction. Um, so um, the first one is, uh, we call it geometric. So it's essentially making a fully connected graph, um, but with some kind of physics driven geometry constraint. So we only allow, um, we allow all connections between um, adjacent layers of the tracker, um, but within some physics driven um, cone space. So we don't you know, allow connections between uh, one part of the detector and then a very far away part of the detector. Um, so it's basically a modified fully connected graph. 
Um, then uh, we've looked at doing some amount of pre-clustering um, where you use some kind of clustering algorithm like dbscan um, uh, to do the graph construction instead. So um, the, uh, this uh, can, can maybe make more efficient graphs because you're not doing that fully connected. Um, or it's actually a modification on the fully connected. So we start with like what's allowed by the, the geometric cut or sorry, geometric construction. And then we further applied DB scan. Um, then we've also looked at data driven methods for graph construction, um, where we look at basically in a separate um, event, um, what uh, components of the detector uh, have true edges between them um, based on true particle trajectories. And then we only allow um, in our graph for uh, a different event, we only allow uh, those types of connections to exist in the graph. Um, and we can compare these graph instruction methods um, with um, a couple of different measurements. So we primarily look at purity, which is the number of true edges captured in the graph. Um, versus all edges, and then also efficiency. Um, so the number of true edges in our graph over all of the true edges that should exist um, in our data set. And we really wanna try to um, balance between those two because we don't want our graphs to be too big. Um, you know, if you wanna maximize efficiency, you would just make a fully connected graph, but that requires a lot of computing resources uh, and will not work for most of the applications we have in particle physics. So we really try to balance between these two. Um, and you can see some comparisons um, between those three different graph constructions. Um, and we found that um, depending a bit on the momentum of the particle that you're looking at, um, typically, um, you uh, achieve the best uh, efficiency uh, purity balance with the uh, data-driven approach, um, but uh, the pre-clustering um, can also match it depending on what type of particle you're looking at. And um, there's still a lot of ongoing work in this area. Um, it's hard to really find the, the optimal solution because it also depends on what architecture you're using afterwards. Um, so we're continuing work in this area, um, including uh, right now one study we're doing is looking at um, if we train on messier, like less efficient, less pure graphs, um, are we, uh, is the GNN kind of better able to learn from that and then do uh, better inference on more efficient graphs uh, at, at inference time. Um, so then the main um, architecture that we've studied uh, to do this type of GNN tracking is called an interaction network, um, which was originally developed by deep uh, researchers at DeepMind um, as a way to um, infer, uh, to learn about uh, uh, to learn about interactions and object dynamics um, and infer next time step, do next time step predictions for physical systems. So it's um, essentially combines a node convolution like I showed a few slides ago um, and an edge convolution. Um, so you're updating both the edge features of the or sorry, both the node features of your graph and the edge features of your graph. Um, and it uh, kind of works in a few steps. So you first create um, a set of object relations. So those are all your pairwise, uh, all of the uh, pairwise uh, relations between nodes in your graph um, based on the, uh, the edges that are included. Um, then you apply uh, a neural network to all of those, um, all of those relation pairs. Um, then you aggregate them, so it's a little bit different than the node of the node um, convolution formalism that I showed before, because you're doing the aggregation after the transformation. Um, but so then you aggregate uh, the transformed uh, relations for each node. Um, and then you use that information, apply a neural network to it again um, to create the updated node features. Um, so in our application, um, we add an additional relational model at the end. Um, so we update the, 
you update the edge features pairwise, you use that to update the node features, and then we add another relational model to do the uh, final edge weight uh, prediction. Um, and uh, we include as our edge features just geometric information um, that describe basically the angle um, and distance in the detector geometry between the two nodes that we're looking at. And we've had really great success with this model. Um, after doing some optimization and hyperparameter scans, um, we were able to build a, a model that achieved state of the art um, tracking uh, efficiency um, with only 6,000 learnable parameter parameters, which is a lot smaller than previous models that have been studied for this. Um, and you can see some of our hyperparameter scans over here for different numbers of um, hidden units in the object and relational model. Um, and again, there's a lot of improvements um, and modifications that can be studied here. Um, so uh, we're, we're still looking at, at uh, further optimizing it, trying to get um, the network even smaller perhaps um, by right now we have uh, a fixed, like we use the same number of hidden units in all the, uh, all three of the models, but you could, um, you know, have variable sizes um, and things like that. So there's a lot of optimizations that could still be done, but it's a very, very promising architecture already. Um, and then you can see a bit more detail about the performance of this algorithm um, broken down by the momentum of different particles that you're trying to do the track reconstruction for. Um, so you can see we get um, above 99.7% um, um, edge classification accuracy for all of the different momentum values. Um, as you go down in momentum, um, the events become more dense. Um, there's more particles, um, which makes the problem more complex. Your graphs become more dense, um, but we still are able to achieve extremely good edge classification efficiency. Um, and then down here, you can see an example of um, a, a processed graph. So the black and green are correctly classified edges, um, and then red and yellow, um, are incorrectly classified edges. And you see in this central region of the detector um, where it's very dense, we have the most particles there. That's where um, the vast majority of our errors are coming from. So again, something we're looking at now is how we can um, try to uh, do a better job in that particular high density region. And I'll talk about some ways we're doing that. Um, uh, in a few slides, um, we also did this kind of um, transfer learning study um, where we looked at uh, applying a network that was trained on a certain P a GNN trained on a certain momentum range um, to a different momentum range and we saw that uh, it's able to uh, pretty much maintain the same efficiency regardless of the momentum range that it was trained on even when we train on really high momentum um, graphs and we apply them to um, more dense, low momentum graphs, we still achieve um, quite good um, edge classification efficiency. Uh, and then finally, um, incorporating that last step of the tracking pipeline where you do um, the actual track candidate construction uh, using your weighted edges um, to build final track candidates. We looked at two different ways of doing this. So um, DB scan, um, which does um, density-based clustering, and then union find, which just, I, which just identifies all the disjoint subsets of your processed graph. Um, and depending on which uh, track building algorithm we used and what momentum range you're looking at and what definition of accuracy you use. So there's a couple of different ways you can define accuracy. Like if you require, um, it to match truth exactly, or if you just require um, it to get like 75% of the hits that are um, really in the trajectory, we see um, a, a range of 70 um, to 99% tracking efficiency. Um, and the current um, kind of state of the art tracking algorithm, the one that will not scale um, to this high density uh, data regime 
um, is around 95% efficient. So this is competitive with that, again, depending on uh, kind of what, uh, what particular types of particles you're looking at. Um, so now I'm going to talk about some of the more exciting kind of innovative work we've been doing um, on this topic um, to kind of address some of those outstanding issues with the kind of basic pipeline that I just described. Um, so sorry, this slide is a little messy, um, but we recently put out a paper or well, uh, yeah, we recently put out a paper a few months ago um, about graph segmentation. Um, for both this tracking data set, um, but also for um, this SCPDB data set, uh, which is a protein data set um, designed to try to identify um, druggable binding sites in proteins. Um, so the kind of question we're asking here is um, to better enable parallel processing, um, for these kind of GNN pipelines we've been looking at, um, especially in constrained resource environments like we have at um, physics experiments, can we pre-segment these graphs um, from either a full detector event or from a full protein? Can we pre-segment them so that you only have to run the GNN, you can run the GNN in parallel on different segments of the graph um, to try to speed up inference? So we looked at several different um, several different uh, clustering algorithms that can be applied to graphs. Um, so dbscan, which I mentioned already. Um, then we also looked at spectral clustering um, that uses the eigenvalues of the graph Laplacian um, uh, to, uh, to do your clustering. Um, and you can kind of dynamically figure out how many clusters you wanna have um, by looking um, for what they call the eigen gap. Um, so if you're looking at like the eigen values of your graph, graph Laplacian, um, where you start to see a big um, uh, increase in the eigen values that typically tells you like how many um, clusters you uh, probably exist in your graph. Um, and then you can use the, those eigen values um, to do the clustering within your graph. Um, we also looked at dynamic K nearest neighbors um, which uh, you're probably familiar with, K nearest neighbors. Um, you uh, uh, look, just looks for some, uh, it connects the K nearest points um, to a particular node, um, but with the dynamic component, um, you can vary the number of clusters um, that you're creating. Um, and then we also looked at Gaussian mixture models, um, which have the assumption that your data is generated by some kind of Gaussian process um, and it tries to figure out like the optimal um, generating Gaussians for your data set. Um, and again, that allows a variable number of clusters to exist. Um, so we looked at these different um, clustering algorithms for both the track graphs and the um, protein graphs. And we looked at two measurements um, to try to describe how well these are doing at effective segmentation. So we look at um, efficiency, which is the number of subgraphs you get out of your clustering compared to the number of objects. So either tracks or binding sites that should exist. Um, and then we also looked at this chi value, which is the number of matched um, subgraphs to truth value. So it would be the number of track candidates um, that actually, or, sorry, the number of subgraphs that are individual particle tracks um, or the number of subgraphs that are distinct binding sites um, over the total number of subgraphs. Um, and we found that um, Gaussian mixture models do a really um, efficient job at segmenting the track data sets. Um, we get um, almost 75% um, percent uh, like distinct subgraphs compared to the number of tracks that should exist. Um, and 80% of those um, are individual particle trajectories. So we're getting like um, around, that would be like 60% of the uh, indig individual particle trajectories we're trying to find. We already distinguished them before even doing any kind of GNN processing. Um, for the Protein data set, the results um, were not quite as good. 
Um, we saw that like dynamic KNN does the best job at graph segmentation, um, but they're only about 50% accurate. So you would definitely need um, some more processing for that, but you can still um, start to parallelize the inference. Um, then this is not necessarily its own study, but just something that I'll talk about for some of our other studies. Um, we were thinking about if there are better ways to represent the track hit data um, and enable track fitting. Um, so there's this um, alternate space uh, called conformal space that is really useful for representing some particle data in um, that basically maps those helical tracks um, to straight lines um, or parabolas, depending on if the track was um, created at the interaction point or somewhere later in the detector. Um, so this transformation can be really useful. We're looking at um, both running full GNN architectures in this space instead of traditional Euclidean space um, to try to see if it's easier for the GNNs to learn um, in that space where tracks are, are straight lines. Um, or uh, we're also looking at after we've done the GNN inference and we've built these track candidates, um, if we can use this conformal transformation to do um, easy track fitting. So you could just, you have your like track candidate from the uh, DB scan clustering or whatever, you can just fit it to a straight line and um, uh, extract track parameters. So we're looking at kind of both of those ideas. Um, so another approach um, that we've started looking at um, for this GNN-based tracking is called object condensation, where we're trying to look at, can we form those track candidate clusters um, without doing um, full edge classification? So without actually removing edges from the graph, but just getting edge weights and then using those edge weights in a smart way. Um, so the pipeline kind of looks like this. Um, we add this additional object condensation step um, to our original GNN pipeline. Um, so you have your input graph, then the edge classifier that predicts some edge weights. Um, then you use those edge weights to help move um, data points that belong to the same track closer together in this new learned space and to repel ones that don't belong to the same track away from each other. And then you still have to do this final clustering um, step, um, but perhaps your clustering will be more efficient once you've done this object condensation. Um, so to do this object condensation approach, uh, we have to modify our loss function by adding some additional terms. So we have our standard BCE loss for the edge um, classification like we use in our normal pipeline, um, but then we add some additional terms that we're trying to predict. So we're trying to predict the condensation likelihood um, of each node. Um, and uh, a learned clustering coordinate. So we're learning a new embedding space for the graph, and then we're predicting um, a likelihood that it belongs to a certain um, condensed cluster. Um, so in, at the truth level, we define um, these condensation points um, that should exist for each track. Um, and during training, we try to learn um, good uh, uh, GNN, uh, convolutions um, that move points towards their um, their truth uh, condensation point. Um, and so we have a, a potential loss that combines an attractive term that tries to pull related points together and a repulsive term that tries to push um, unrelated points apart. And then we also have a background loss term um, that seeks to distinguish um, any nodes that don't belong to any actual tracks and to try to separate them from everything else. So our full uh, training optimizes over the combination of these three terms where the um, background loss is really downweighted compared to the other two because it's not quite as important, at least in this particular data set. And we've seen some um, really promising results from this already. Um, we get a comparable edge classification efficiency to our previous architecture. 
um, and good uh, uh, convergence of the attractive and uh, repulsive loss as well as the background loss. Um, and we see um, when we do the full track, uh, tracking efficiency calculation, similar, per, pretty similar performance to um, just the standard pipeline, but we actually get lower um, fake rates, which means we're identifying fewer false tracks, um, which is another really important consideration um, for uh, for doing tracking in these kind of detectors. So, um, and this hasn't really been optimized at all. Um, so it's a really promising direction that could potentially even surpass the kind of interaction network approach we've been looking at. Um, then uh, another idea we're looking at is what we are calling one-shot architectures, where we try to incorporate track fitting directly into the pipeline. So right now, with uh, both the object condensation and the interaction network architectures, um, we only get out track candidates. Um, and the final step in doing tracking is getting things like the momentum uh, and the uh, vertex of the track. So um, we're interested in trying to do this directly in the GNN. And so you can apply, like I said, a conformal fit after you do the um, track uh, after the GNN inference. Um, but what we're really interested in is adding a term um, to the loss function um, that could uh, do track parameter prediction directly. Um, so we've started looking at that. Unfortunately, like no real results yet because it's, it's quite difficult to balance um, so many loss terms we're finding, um, but that's the direction we're looking to move in. Um, and then I'm gonna skip over, I think, these few slides, um, but this is basically talking about an architecture that we've been looking at to try to do to, an attempt at this one shot tracking approach um, where we incorporate the track parameter predictions. And it's based on a instance segmentation bounding box architecture um, where instead of doing edge classification, um, we try to identify, um, we try to uh, identify bounding ellipses um, that separate individual tracks from each other. Um, so this is what's done in a lot of image recognition in standard machine learning, um, typically with, with boxes. Um, here we've done ellipses because it fits um, kind of better with the shape that these um, particle tracks come in. Um, so basically what uh, we do is we define um, a bounding ellipse for each track. We encode that with uh, the individual node location. So for each node in the graph, we're trying to predict um, the ellipse that it should belong to. Um, so our, our kind of full network structure um, has three different branches. We have a classification branch that's doing that background distinguish, or sorry, background classification, um, like I mentioned in the object condensation architecture. Then um, we have the localization branch that predicts the bounding ellipse for each node. Then those are merged to create our final ellipses that should separate each track. And then we have a tracking branch that predicts the track parameters. And so the final loss function is a combination of each of those three goals. Um, and you can see some very preliminary um, results here. Um, we looked at both conformal space, which is what these two plots are showing, and then just um, Euclidean space. And it works fairly well in Euclidean space. Um, we uh, definitely get some overlap between like nearby tracks. Um, so we're still trying to fine tune our merging. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't seem to work in conformal space um, because the ellipses um, are so stretched out in that space. It's, it seems to be hard for the GNN to really learn the parameters efficiently, um, but we're still doing um, ongoing work um, on this project. And I, I linked to our um, first paper about it. And then quickly, um, I want to talk about this last paper um, that we recently put out, which is on 
a different topic, um, but still using GNNs for reconstruction. So um, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Savannah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, it's just because we have 10 minutes um, left on the presentation. We, if we can leave some 10 minutes for people to ask questions. Okay, yeah, okay? I'll just go through this really quickly, if that's okay. Um, so here we're looking at, um, instead of doing trajectory finding, looking at grouping um, uh, decay products of a particle together um, and uh, then identifying the particle that that uh, decay, sp uh, decay spray came from. And um, sorry, I didn't, <laughs> I had a lot of computer issues. So I didn't really finish this slide, but basically an idea that has been kicked around a lot is um, that uh, particle physics and a lot of other data sets as well are governed by symmetries that dictate um, how the particles should interact with each other, how they should decay. Um, and so there's an idea that constraining um, the functions learned by a network um, can help reduce the model size. Um, you need fewer parameters to learn um, the appropriate classification function. Um, and you can also reduce the training resources needed um, to develop the full pipeline. So in the paper I linked to here, we introduced this new architecture VecNet um, that abstracts out both the idea of equivariance, um, but also other um, components of uh, GNN architectures for physics tasks, like your graph construction method, um, your aggregation method, these different kinds of things. Um, and so we abstract out all of those as hyperparameters, um, and we allow for equivariant information to flow through the scalar and vector channels that propagate um, equivariant scalars and equivariant vectors. And then we have a separate hidden channel that just allows any type of information to flow through the network. Um, and what we're trying to figure out is if equivariance, uh, what impact equivariance actually has on a model, if it does allow you to build more efficient models or not. So we studied a particular type of jet tagging problem, um, uh, and we looked at Lorentz invariance, which is a, a type of uh, uh, a type of symmetry that um, all uh, relativistic particles. Um, so very high energy particles should obey. And we um, looked at the impact of equivariance and these different hyperparameters on both the accuracy of the model, um, but also this ant factor, which compares um, the accuracy to the size of a model. And the kind of interesting result that I wanna highlight here is um, we found there seems to be a really non-trivial optimum that combines some amount of equivariant information with some amount of non-equivariant information. And um, for this particular task, the most efficient configuration we found um, combined four hidden channels. So four, um, uh, four channels of non-equivariant information with um, two vector channels and eight scalar channels. So it seems that allowing some amount of non-equivariant information into your model helps increase the accuracy, but uh, having the bulk of your information be um, have this enforced symmetry can help constrain the model size. So this is a really interesting direction that we're still pursuing. We're looking at different types of symmetry beyond just the rent symmetry, um, and then also trying to bring in some interpretability methods to look at what is being learned by these hidden channels. So I will, um, stop there and yeah happy to take any questions thank you so much um savannah um so i'm gonna take some questions from the audience so raise your hands if you have questions otherwise you can type it on the chat um i'm gonna take the first two questions uh, santiago on slide 17 was asking this is very specific what, what's on the x-axis slide 17. Let's see Oh, sorry. So this is momentum of the track. Yeah, thank you. And um, we have another question from Chi Chiang. Um, I think it was slide 19. They said, can we have the slides if you can share the slides? Basically, so he can get the paper link on the slides. Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely happy to share the slides. Okay, thank you. 
um, if anyone else has any other questions, please raise your hand and I'll give you the floor. There's a question in the chat. Um, what are the graph neural networks trained on? Are they simulated on Monte Carlo data? Yeah. Yeah. So um, right now, all of the all of the data is simulation um, because we need the the true labels. Um, so we want to know actually what process all this data is originating from, what the track components. Um, uh, track parameters should be or what the jet labels should be. So it's all trained on simulation right now, Monte Carlo simulation, um, primarily open source, but we're starting to look at um, also simulation um, from individual particle ex uh, physics experiments at the Large Hadron Collider, as well as um, actual data from those detectors. So once we have an idea about how efficient our model actually is, we can start to use it on real data um, and see if it's able to translate. But right now, yeah, all of the training is Monte Carlo simulation. Thank you. Um, we have another question from Ari. He's asking, what's the best place to start if you want to get familiar with GNNs? Yeah, that's that's a good question. So um, in general, um, I think uh, Michael Bronstein had a really great talk. Uh, I'm spacing on what conference it was at right now, but if you Google like Michael Bronstein um, GNNs, uh, it should be one of the first results. So that's a really like intuitive talk, I think, with a lot of um, really great uh, graphics. Um, then he also recently put out a book with some different um, collaborators that's like graphs, gauges, geodesics, something like that, geometric, ge geometric like machine learning graphs, gauges, and geodesics. Um, awesome. Uh, so the link is, is already in the chat. Um, and then there are some good overview papers as well um, that I don't necessarily remember the names of right now, but I really think Michael Bronstein's material is really useful for learning. And then um, if you're interested in like particle physics applications of GNNs, there's a great um, summary paper called GNNs in, I believe it's GNNs in particle physics, um, which is written by um, some of my collaborators. Um, so that's a nice summary as well. Thank you. Um, we have a last question from Will. Are you considering using any semi-supervised approaches when transitioning from simulated to real experimental data? Yeah, we're definitely thinking about that. Um, we're still really in the early stages of um, looking at the actual experimental data. Um, and even going from this um, kind of open source detector simulation to the actual experiment simulations has um, required a lot of adjustments and retraining. Um, but yeah, that's definitely something we're thinking about. We're just not quite there yet. Thank you. I think, um, yeah, that, that will, we can close here. And um, thank you so much, Savannah, for doing this lecture. And also, it was a very popular one. So thanks, everyone, for attending as well. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. Bye, everyone.